Even that rich person is, is not rich, is poor, because everybody will be looking up to that person. But when everyone is blessed, you will even be struggling. Don't pay it, I will pay it. Leave that one, I will do it. Don't do it, because I can do it. Everybody will be struggling to, to do something. So let's all pray. Every member of my family, let no one be left out. Bless every member of my family. Let us pray for our siblings, for our friends, people that are close to us, our nuclear family, let us ask Father, let, let, let no one be left behind. Bless every member of my family. Open doors to every member. Is there anyone that is struggling academically, financially? Hmm. Father, open the door in the name of Jesus. Let the doors be open for every member in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Father, because we know you are faithful and you have opened the door. May your name be blessed forever and ever. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we are giving thanks. Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning. Thank you because indeed you are a faithful God. For all that you have done, that you are doing, and we are doing in our lives, we give you glory. Father, thank you because we know that you would have started this good in our life. We are able to perfect it. May your name be praised forever and ever in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Lord, we ask, oh God, even as we come before you this morning, that your presence will be mighty in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we ask that you will manifest your glory in our individual lives in the name of Jesus. But I will pray for all our lovers that are connected to us, oh God, that the doors in their lives also will be opened, Amen. even as you are opening doors for us in Jesus' Amen. name. Thank you, Lord, because we know Thank you have done it. Lord, we ask, oh God, that this service will glorify you. Amen. Father, nothing will be done here that will give the Holy Spirit in the name Amen. of Jesus. Father, Lord, we invite you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Let someone shout a powerful hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Okay, so we said one of the things that we learned from Solomon's life is that riches and wisdom, yes, beautiful and very good thing to have. However, they are not in themselves sufficient enough to keep us spiritually safe, especially if we decide to um, disobey God's words. And we saw how Solomon was so blessed with wisdom and then, you know, so blessed with riches. But when he decided to disobey God's word, and how a big turnaround happened to him for the negative, and then things started going out of control. So, even though he was wise, he was wise even though he had a lot of um, um, wealth, you know, his disobedience of God's word became a major problem. Okay, can I also encourage us to move forward? Let's, let's occupy the front seats. God bless you as you do so. Let's just move forward. Let's occupy the front seats so that uh, we are not distracted when other people come in into the service. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so if you remember last week Sunday also we said we, it's, it's a two-part series where we're looking at Bible character. So today we're looking at second Bible character. And the second Bible character is Mighty Samson. Mighty Samson. I'm sure many of us have read stories about Samson. We've heard a lot of stories about Samson. This is a man that has very unusual gift. Or unusual gift from God. You know, the Spirit of God manifests in different ways in people's life. It manifests in the life of Samson in a very, very unusual way. Because his gift was more physical. Something that can be seen, you know. You know, some people may be gifted with healings, with doing of miracles. Some people may be gifted with words of wisdom. Some people may be gifted with ability to discern spirit. Samson Zoom was a physical gift. He was a supernatural man when it comes to you know spirit. I mean, physical strength. He can do a lot of things that normal human being can do. And I think that uh, there's the Hollywood character. Uh, that the big Samson, they call him Hercules. How many of us have seen Hercules? Hercules was, is a Hollywood, Hollywood character that can do so many things. He can, he can lift heavy objects that you know, natural strength can. So that just gives us an idea of the kind of man Samson is. So we're going to be looking at this man today. But most importantly, we're going to look at his character and his achievement, the thing that he was able to achieve, and we're also going to look at the flaws in his life. But most importantly for us, the lessons that we can learn from the life of Samson. That's one thing that I want us to, be, to focus on today, to bring out lessons for us, for us from the life of Samson. So, we have the, the agenda, the introduction, then we look at Samson's character, achievements, and flaws. We look at the lessons from Samson's life and then conclude on a few things. Now let's start. Let's start by reading our memory verse. Or let's start with our Bible passage first. A Bible passage is taken from it's taken from Judges chapter 13. We'll read from verse 1 to 5. Judges chapter 13 from verse 1 to 5. Can we have that on the screen? Okay. So no, the, the, the Bible passage. The next one. This is the memory scripture. Yes, thank you. I think that was not probably everything. Judges chapter 5, from verse 1 to. Yeah, Judges chapter 13. From verse 1 to 5. That's the scripture, but the Bible reference there is not correct. Okay, thank you. Let's go ahead and read. And it says, And again the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah, and of the, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children. 
but you shall conceive and bear a child. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's, that's the Bible scripture that talks about, you know, the, the introduction, the entrance of Daniel into the earth. So our memory scripture is taken from the fifth verse of that Bible chapter, Judges chapter 13, from verse 5. It says, For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Praise the Lord. A long one. But long and short of it is that this child would be a special child. His assignment has been you know, made clear, and that is to deliver, to begin the deliverance of Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. However, it's a special child, and certain things must be observed. Clear instruction given by the angel to Samson's mother. Now, as a matter of introduction, Samson was a judge for 20 years in Israel. So, in those days, before the errors of the monarch, the king, the judge ruled, and they, they, they decide matters. So, Samson was in that category. But one thing about Samson is that he is one of the of three other one of four characters in the Bible who had their coming prophesied. The angels spoke about their giving birth, about their birth even before they arrived. One is who Isaac, I uh, sorry Jacob. Another one is who John the Baptist. Remember when the angel appeared to um, John the Baptist's mother and told her that she was going to have a child and then told the father and the father said it's not possible and then there was a confirmation the angel reappeared unto the father again and told the father the same thing that you're going to have a special child who has a very special commission the third person who had that kind of uncommon privilege is Jesus Christ when the angel appeared to Mary and said you have been favor among all women that you're going to give birth to a child and that child is going to be the savior of the world. Praise the Lord. So not too many people have similar opportunity that Samson had. It was just one of the very few people who the angel or who God announced their coming even before they were, you know, before they arrived. And their assignments were even clearly stated. Assignments clearly stated. John was supposed to be a pace setter. Clearly stated. Jesus Christ could deliver, you know, Samson's assignment is to begin the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. Now that gives us an idea of what's happening. But around this particular period, they call it the Dark Age in the history of Israel, when they were slaves to their neighbors. So it's been on for a long time, and they were waiting for deliverance. They were waiting for people, somebody who will come to deliver them. And God has God positioned Samson as one person who will start that process of delivery, a big assignment that he had. And the things that was supposed to be done about him was also said to his mother. Praise the Lord. Now, so this is the character we are looking at. One who is gifted by God to be able to do the assignment that is committed to him. He had physical strength. He can do a lot of things. One of the things that we had, you know, we said he has past, we have, we have um, supernatural strength, and he could kill a lion with his bare hands. He actually did. He killed a lion with his bare hands. Not too many people can do that. How many people can even <laughs> kill an antelope with a bare hand? You probably need something to do that. Praise the Lord. Now, this is a man who can stand the size and the intimidating size of a lion and battle the lion and kill the lion. He is a man that could leave the gate of a city with his hand. You know, gate that is planted and rooted in, he pulled it, the Bible says that he pulled the gate and he climbed the mountain with the gate. 
So you can imagine this person that we're talking about. He's got great spirit, supernatural strength, physical strength. And even in the place in the Bible, we talked about him killing thousands of Philistine soldiers with the jaw of an ass. He just went into the camp with the jaw of an ass, and then, because his assignment was to do what? To deliver Israel. And to deliver Israel, he had to put fear in the mind of Israel's opposition. Praise the Lord. So he was gifted for his assignment. Okay, so that's the man we are looking at today. And his achievements are part of the things that we are, we are looking at. Killed lion, he ruled over Israel for 40 years and for 20 years as a judge. And he is highly intelligent as well. Because when he gives parable, nobody can unravel his riddles unless, you know, he comes to tell what the riddle is. Highly intelligent. And one thing also about Samson that he enjoyed answer prayers. So he had a relationship with God. When he prayed to God, God answered him. Although on one occasion he was the fatal one, because his prayer also led to the end of his life and his ministry. However, some of his flaws, to say his achievements, some of his flaws ignored and violated his Nazarene vow. When he was when the angel appeared to his mother, he told him that this child is a special child. No razor should come on his head. Foolishly, Samson put himself in a position where he had to be shaped. And that was a major breach, major breach of his Nazarene. He relied on his own physical strength. Something similar to Solomon here. Solomon was gifted with wisdom. And he relied on his own wisdom and disobeyed God. Samson gifted with physical strength. He relied on his physical strength and begin to disdain, you know, God's instruction. In Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3. He, also, he was also courageous before men, but weak when it comes to women. Something could stand and confront thousands of armies. But with one man, or with one woman, something, you know, they say he froze. He couldn't, he couldn't control his emotions anymore when it came to the case of Delilah. It was weak, his weakness for Philistine's women led to his flaw. We're talking about his flaw. His weakness for the Philistine woman led to his flaw. Because he was so in love with this lady, Delilah, that he did not realize when he was being trapped. So, and that led to his flaw. His passion for women was more important to him than God's will. Because God told him, part of the things that God said to his mother, and you know, that was passed on to him, that he must stay away from fermented drink, alcohol, or otherwise, and he must not shave his head. But because of his love for women, all this instruction from God was thrown into the wind. He had unlimited potential to deliver his people, but his history ended in tragedy. Plus, he had unlimited potential because he, could, he was just invincible. He did things that no man can do. So he could have started and, you know, made the progress for the deliverance of Israel far ahead. But because of his weakness, he did what? His, his life ended in tragedy. He died with his enemy in verse 16 of Judges chapter 13, verse 30. He was also shallow and vengeful like the Philistines. Similar to the world's mindset today, and contrary to the teaching of Christ, he was shallow and vengeful. He always wanted to get you know, the upper hand against his enemy. And he was also disobedient to God's instruction. So these are his flaws. Now we look at his, his achievements and his flaws. And we'll go quickly through that because I want us to spend more time looking at his, the lessons that we can learn from Samson's life. So we'll quickly move into the second lesson outline. Lessons from Samson's life. Lessons from Samson's life. The first one that we will see is the fact that God is ever faithful to give us great spiritual strength when we need it. And now this is very important for us. We may not be blessed in the way Samson was blessed that he had physical strength. And I even wonder how much achievement we're going to have. You know, just being you know, physically strong, we can kill lion, we can move the gates of the city, we can do that. That's not going to achieve too much for us in the modern day that we have. 
However, God is still in the business of giving his children what is needed for their assignments. So that's one lesson that I want us to do. The assignment of Samson was a military assignment and the physical strength is required. So he was massively blessed in that regard. Your assignment, my assignment, will not be in that category. But for whatever assignment God has given to us, He is ever faithful to give us spiritual strength when we need it. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So what is the thing that you have been assigned to do? What is the thing that I have been assigned to do? What is my destiny? What is that thing that God has committed to my hand? For every child of God, there is, a, there is an assignment that you have. And with that assignment, there is always a provision for you to be able to succeed in that assignment. So the spiritual gifting for that, God can make it available for you. And then, the lesson for us is, what is my achievement? What is my assignment that I have discovered? Am I working efficiently and effectively in that assignment? If I am not, I can ask God for that spiritual strength that is needed. Praise the Lord. I can ask God for the spiritual strength that is needed for me to fulfill the assignment that he has given to me. Because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I remember what he said. He said, when we ask, we will do what? He will give to us. When we seek, we will find. When we knock, it shall be open unto us. So we can ask God for the spiritual assignment. If you are struggling with your assignment, God can give you the gift for you to be able to succeed in that assignment. He has done it. He did it to Solomon. Solomon needed wisdom to rule over Israel. God gave him wisdom. Daniel needed physical strength to be able to start the deliverance of the children of Israel. God gave him physical strength. What's your assignment? You can ask God and God will give it to you. Number two, watch out for things and people that can entice you to sin. Now, this is a summary of life and devil's strategy. The strategy is to cut our relationship with God, which is our supply. Once he can do that, then the person is up for being programmed. And the way he does that is to bring it up things or people that will entice us to sin. During the dark ages of Israel, during the dark period of Israel, the Bible says that they sinned and they brought idols into the camp. And once they have done that, what happened? The communication between them, the relationship between them and God got severed at that particular point in time. And then their neighbors come in and take the spoil. And the same thing happens to us as believers. When we give in to sin, then we open the door for avalanche of troubles. Something in his own case gave way to sin because every commandment that was given to him by God was breached. He gave into alcohol, went in with strange women, eventually his hair, his hair was, stripped, was, was cut, and then he lost his spiritual power. And that's the same thing that happens to children of God as well. When we give in to sin, by the enticement through people or things around us, it drains away our spiritual capacity to be able to fulfill the assignment that God has given to us. Praise the Lord. I want to read this Bible passage from the MSG version. If you can get that for us. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14 to 18 says, Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? That's not partnership. That's war. It is, is light best friend with darkness? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up a pagan idol in God's holy temple? But well, that's exactly what we have. Each of us, a temple in whom God lives. God himself put it this way. He says, I'll live in them, move in them. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. 
So, leave the corruption and the compromises. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who will do what who will pollute you. And that's, just, that's, that's the lesson we need to learn from Samson. Don't link up with we who will pollute you. Samson left the entire Israel and started fraternizing with different people. And he got polluted. And because he got polluted, he was drained of his supernatural ability. And even though he was able to start his assignment, he couldn't move too far in that world. That will not be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever God has committed you to your hand, because we are learning from Samson's flaws and mistakes this morning, you will realize and you will not be enticed by people or by things to sin in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's go on to the next one. Now, seemingly harmless things are simply bait for the devil to encourage, I put it in quote, deeper sins. You know, those, those things that look seemingly harmless. Oh, yeah, I can get away with that. It's not important. It's not, oh, like, that's not too old. Oh, don't, don't be a fanatic, you know? You get to the, oh, you're beginning to become a fanatic about this issue. You know, it's not as serious as that. Those seemingly harmless sins, they are bait for the devil to encourage you to do bigger and worse sins. Now, if you look in Psalm, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2 to 15, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2 to 15, is the story of three characters, David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. Do we all remember that story? Yes. David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. And what happened? You know, the end of the story is that David committed murder. He killed somebody. But where did it start from? It started from the fact that David neglected his duty as a leader. In verse 1, the Bible says that it was the day and there was war. And the, in those days, the war is supposed to be in the forefront of the king. I mean, sorry, the king is supposed to be in the forefront of the war. Now, David sent everybody to war and he stayed back in the house. He neglected his duty as a leader. Now, so, neglect, as simple as this, of course, you may say, oh, Oh, I've, I've, I've led Israel into war, so many wars, and I, this time around, I think I should just stay back and rest. However, it was a neglect of his duty, because as his responsibility, as the king and the leader, he was supposed to be in the forefront, protecting the people from any threat. Now, he was in breach of neg negligence, and that spiraled into murder at the end of it. And this is the lesson that I took away from here. No matter how simple, or how harmless that action is, if it is not in accordance with the will of God, I should be wary of it. Because it may lead me and take me beyond where I actually think. Some things happen to us and we're trying to make a decision. Now, no, I, I, can just, I can just manage with this. The end of the process, you cannot imagine. David would never have imagined that staying back in the house, in the palace, and not going to war, will eventually lead to him committing murder. Okay, he started from that, and then the loss of the eyes and the lack of ability to control himself, then treachery and betrayal, to the point that he was even willing that the woman's husband would be killed. His whole sense of reasoning was all gone in the wind. And he said, Oh, cause the man, let the man come home. And they brought him home. He wanted to entice him to go to go and be with his wife. And the man was more responsible than the king. He said, I cannot be in bed with my wife. When Israel is under threat and my police are at war, I would rather be with them, defending the integrity of this nation, than going to be with my wife. The king didn't <laughs> think to see that that is important. The man did not. And because a sin has been committed, you know, the natural tendency is that more sin will be committed to cover that sin. So David, in the, in the, in the quest to cover the sin, decided that the thing to do is just to eliminate this man and get him out of the way. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. And so, he ended up committing murder. A chain reaction of evil. It starts with a speck, and it becomes a mighty issue in the hand. That's lesson, a lesson for us to learn. No matter how small that that sin is, a sin is sin, and it should be taken as serious as that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, the next point is that there is always a way to come back to God, and never ignore that way. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, this is also very critical. 
And I think this marked a major difference between the character we looked at last week and this character. Samson had breached, he had done so many wrong doings. But somehow in his life, he got to a point and he realized that he needed to go back to God. And he took advantage of that situation. He took advantage of that situation. In Isaiah chapter, can we open to Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18? Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together. Even though your sins may be as red as scarlet, they shall be what? It's, it's, even though they are as red as scarlet, some scripture says they may be as red like crimson. You see, they shall be white as wool. They shall be white as wool. Let us reason together. Let us come together. Always make sure. Listen. I'm talking about lesson here. Always make sure that you never get to a position where you think you are far too gone to come back to God. No matter how big the sin is, no matter how terrible you think the act that you have committed is, there's always a way to come back to God. And that way should never be regretted, should never be ignored. Praise the Lord. Because God says it. He says, come, let us listen together. No matter how bad your acts of sinfulness may be, no matter how terrible you think that act that you have committed is, we can always make it good. We can always make it good. There is a way of redemption. There is a door that is always available. And the devil's strategy is always to tell you that you are too terrible and God doesn't want to have anything to do with you. That's the strategy. To keep us perpetually away from God. Oh, you have done this thing. God will never forgive you for that. That's them speaking. But God says, no. No matter how bad it is, come, let us listen. Because even though your sins may be as red as scarlet, they can be made white as snow. That's a lesson for us. Samson realizes, however, it was late in his life that he realizes. But that realization, I think, makes a major difference, as we're going to see going on in this lesson. He realized that he can always come back to God. And that was why he prayed to God when he was in shame, Christ plucked out, hair shoved off. And he said, God, even for this last time, let my power be restored unto me. And I think. Without action, because the Bible says that in his death he killed more Philistines than he killed while he was alive. So I think that action effectively begins the deliverance of Israel. Because if he has killed so many Philistine soldiers, then the Philistines are exposed and the Israelites can begin to regain their independence again from them. So I think he was able to, at that particular point in time, connect back to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now let's move on to the next one. Spiritual gifts are not indicative of spiritual maturity. And this is very important. I may be here and having the power to do great miracles. I have the power to, you know, to prophesy and foretell things that will happen in the future because I'm gifted by God. It does not necessarily translate into spiritual maturity. And I'm sure we've seen that even in the life of Solomon, who was gifted with wisdom. But in so many ways, he acted immaturely. In Samson's case, gifted with strength, and in so many ways, also acted immaturely. So, being gifted spiritually is not equal to spiritual maturity. Maturity is a journey. It's a process that must be undergone. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, verse 22 to 23, talks about spiritual gifts. And it talks about, it says, love, joy, Peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self control, against which there is no what? There is no law. These are things that bring us into maturity. When we show love, when we show peace, when we show joy, when we show ability to suffer long, when we show goodness, have faith, and we are gentle, self control. These are the things that bring us into maturity. Not my ability to do, you know, supernatural things alone. Praise the Lord. So, as evidence in Samson's life and in Solomon's life, spiritual gifts does not translate into spiritual maturity. You must go through and express the gifts, the fruits of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Now, the last one says, God would rather forgive than judge. God would rather forgive than judge. And I think this is the awesome thing about our God. The willingness to always forgive us and bring us back to Himself. 
no matter how far they may have gone away from him. And that was also expressed in Samson's life. Samson had broken all the rules. But God still forgave him and brought him back. How do I know? Something very important. You know, when you read the story of Samson's life in Second Kings, I mean in, in Judges chapter 13, you may want to conclude and be wondering what's the fate of this man when it comes to eternity. But when you go fast forward into the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, his name appears in the hall of faith. And so amazing that there is still a record of positive things for Samson. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, he says, And what more shall I say? For the time will fail me to tell you of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson and Jephthah. So even though this man had broken all the rules, all the protocols, all the engagements, the rules of engagement with God, he still finds a way to come back to God. Because he knew exactly where to reconnect to God. And that was an act we saw when he prayed to God. Keep me this one last opportunity. So a lesson for us. God is always waiting to forgive us. No matter what we've done. You know, we are human beings. And like we said during the preview yesterday, we have our heart in his ears. Every one of us have our soft spots. Areas where the devil is trying to, you know, to cause us to, to sleep, to fall. And if you find out that you yielded to temptation in those areas, it is not a death sentence, spiritually. Because God says that it would rather that sin has come to repentance. And he always made a way of salvation for us. And that's why I said here, he would rather forgive us than judging us. And that's a lesson for someone here. Did you think or you consider that you've done something so terrible and that God does not have interest in you anymore? No. He's always willing to forgive. He's always willing to forgive. He's always willing. He sees us differently the way that the way we see ourselves. He sees us in a different dimension than the way we see ourselves. He sees us coming back to him. And he says, if you repent and confess your sin, that God is always willing to forgive and bring us back into the fold. Amen. Amen. So that's a great advantage for us. And we must never forget that as individuals, as believers. And no matter where we find ourselves in the situation of life, there is always the door to go back to God. And we should always use that door. Praise the Lord. Amen. We should always use that door. So that's the lessons that we've seen in Samson's life that we want to consider today. The first one, God is ever faithful to give us the spiritual, um, the spiritual strength that we need to fulfill our assignment. Always be on the washout for people or things and they want to cause you to sin. They are bound. They are in, in one thousand, in millions, in numbers of them. People and things that we want to commit sin. Because the highs of the Lord is too holy to be no sin. And when the devil wants to take us away from God's plan, he makes sure that we are exposed to sin. Number four, number three, seemingly harmless sins are simple baits for the devil to encourage us to go deeper in sin. Five, there is always a way back to God. Never ignore that way. And the last, the, the second and the last one, spiritual gifts are not indicative of spiritual maturity. Last one, God will rather forgive than judge. These are lessons that we want to take away from the life of Santi. Do we have any questions in the next two minutes? Question? Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Instructions to the mom. No hard uh, drinks. Something came forth. No razor on his head. And when there's no razor on the head, there's a twisting. Local parlance, Ladakh. <laughs> so, can we currently, because, and how, okay, let me put it this way how do we view such persons who we see? Back home, I've not seen any person who actually has. That are here that did not create it. But back home, how do we relate? I'm trying to use a 
church now mm. and other churches who appreciate Gaga? How, okay. do we, how do we associate ourselves with them? Thank you very much, sir. I, I, I can't understand and appreciate your question. Okay. But you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, Elder John, are you with me? I'm going to take you a little bit away to something I think should be more interesting to us. We are Nazarene spiritually. Out of physical look. The Nazarene is one who is dedicated to God for a particular assignment. And that individual must make sure that they abstain from certain things. We are spiritual Nazarenes. God has committed assignments into our hands. Synonymous to cutting of hair or you no know, braid, braid not coming to the head, is being consecrated to God for a particular assignment. And do not deconsecrate by bringing upon yourself the things that God says don't. For example, in some Samson's case, don't touch dead body. Don't drink fermented drink. What are the things that you know that is synonymous to touching of dead body and abolition in spiritual matters? Sin. Don't go near those, that, those things. So that your spiritual favors, your spiritual strength is not drawn away. I try to understand the question that you're about to say. Do not be moved by physical appearance. Because God does not look at physical appearance. Okay? So if a man decides that he's not going to shave his head, was there a pronouncement? Was there, was there an announcement? Was, was, is that relevant to his assignment in God's kingdom? If it is relevant to his assignment in God's kingdom, if it is not, it does not matter. That's the, that's the way I want us to look at it. And that thing that we are separating ourselves onto, is it relevant to the things that God wants us to do? If it is, in Samson's case, it was relevant. Because it was actually pre-announced. No blade in his head. No touching of dead animals. No drinking of fermented drinks. These were necessary. Of course, I think because God knows the end of the matter from the beginning, he knew that this thing were going to be Samson's Achilles deal. So it was already crafted into his destiny. And the parents were given advance notice. Because I think it is someone who is drunk eh, and is out of his senses that will be behaving like Samson was popping out of destiny and, in, and into destiny. Okay. So that's how I'm saying. I quite appreciate your question. That some, sometimes we we, we 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 look at those class of people and we don't want to consider them, you know, as a, or sometimes we become too superstitious about them, and then it may affect our judgment of them. But I want us as children of God, relevant to us is what are the things that I'm doing that is necessary for my assignment in God's kingdom. Am I keeping to the terms of the of the of the, of the condition? in terms of the game. Praise the Lord. Okay. In conclusion, number one is that Samson was a man destined by God for greatness. But due to his short, due to his many flaws, his life was cut short. We should learn great lessons from his, from his life. He was destined for a great work. Yes, he was redeemed because if I want to judge by Hebrews chapter 11 verse as uh, 32. I think something may be in good state now. However, his life was cut short. He was killed. And that's what sins do. Even when we sin, we may go to God and ask for forgiveness. But how about the scar that comes as a result of that sin? How about the scar? What do you do with the scar? The scar in Samson's life was very, very devastating because it cost him his life. He could have lived longer. He could have judged Israel for a longer period. But because of his recklessness, his life was cut short. That will not be you and I in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Number two is that Samson's story is a strong, or should be, to sound a strong, um, Samson's story is a strong warning. warning. Yeah, that's what should be. There should be a strong warning to everyone, of course, never to toy with sin. Never to toy with sin. No matter, no matter the amount of spiritual victims you have, no matter how blessed you think you are being by God, never toy with sin because it can just wreck everything. 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 You can just wreck it. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. He said, My eyes are too holy to behold sin. 
So if a man is playing with sin, you are asking God to look away from you. Even Jesus, when he was carrying the sin of the whole world upon his shoulder, he, you know, he had to, he had to especially ask for a special situation in that condition. God will not change his word for anything. My eyes are too holy to behold sin. Regardless of who that individual is, if you have a sin in your life, regardless of the gifting that you may have, regardless of the blessing that you may have, sin will truncate everything. So that's one lesson that we should also take away. Never toy with sin. Because it may appear that we are so gifted with God, by God today, and things are happening for us positively. You know, we're breaking through in this area, breaking through in that area. But when we toy with sin, it brings everything crashing down like a pack of cards. And that will not be you and me in the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we close our eyes as we pray? I just wanted to pray to God this morning and ask, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, that I will not toy with sin. In everything that I will do, that I will recognize your instruction for my life. And I will walk by it in the name of Jesus. I will not derail my destiny by falling into sin. I will not toy with sin in the name of Jesus. And give me the grace to always recognize devil when it comes with the wise in the name of Jesus. Thank you, O Lord, that I will not toy with sin in the mighty name of Jesus. And I also want you to pray, Father Lord, help me to discover your purpose and your plan for my life. And give me the grace to walk in this purpose and in this counsel in the name of Jesus. That I may, it may be written of me that I have done and have fought a good fight in the mighty name of Jesus. That I will be so relevant to the things that God has planned for my life. And I will not walk away from them in the mighty name of Jesus. Give me insight, O oh Lord. Let me understand, O oh Lord, your purpose for my life. And let me stick by it. In the name of Jesus. The strength to be able to fulfill my assignment, let it come upon me in the name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Shall we rise up? I want us to begin to give thanks to the Lord as the choir comes to start um, worship. Let us lift up the name of the Lord. Let us magnify his name. Let us Bless him for his great works in our life, for the testimonies that we've been you know, hearing, and for the miraculous work that God is doing in our lives. Let us begin to thank him. Let us worship him. Let us give him praise.
the advantage that we have in the next two minutes and to speak to God. Lord, let great and fathom doors be open unto me. Let great doors be open unto me. Doors for progress, doors for peace, doors for joy, doors for divine help. Let the doors of great things be opened unto me. I want you to go ahead and pray this morning in the name of Jesus. Let the doors of great things be opened unto me. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, the doors of progress in life. In the name of Jesus, Lord, the door of divine health. Let it be opened unto me. In the name of Jesus, oh God, Lord, that I may walk into newness of life, that I may walk into new areas of life. In the name of Jesus, away from stagnation, away from bad health, away from lack of joy, away from lack of peace, walking into the door of peace, walking into the door of joy, walking into the door of happiness, walking into the door of divine health. In the name of Jesus. And let us also pray that every door of negativity be short. In the name of Jesus. Everything that is happening in my life that is negative. Lord, use this occasion, Lord. My fellowship with you this morning. Shut those doors in the name of Jesus. I don't want to experience war. I don't want to experience difficulties anymore. I don't want to experience stagnation anymore. I don't want to experience bad health anymore. Lord, let those doors be shut. In the name of Jesus. What door the Lord has shut no man will open. In the mighty name of Jesus. And so this will be my experience. And this will be your experience. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful Father. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we we'll pray. Amen. Father, as your children, we come together and we declare this morning that doors of good things will be opened unto us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we also say in the same breath that every door of negativity be shut in the same in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our life will begin to reflect your glory for our life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, faithful Father. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your holy name. Yes, In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us appreciate the name of the Lord this morning. Let's begin to reverence his holy name. Let's sing psalms to him. Appreciate the name of the Lord for all that he has done in our life. In our lives, Lord, we say thank you. We give you all the praise. Thank you for another Sunday. Appreciate the name of the Lord. Appreciate his presence in this house. Lord, we thank you.
wish you the final yes, the final. Thank you. Let's also appreciate the Sunday School teaching team. Wonderful things, his presence, his presence. And for a way of introduction, when we hear the word presence, God's presence, God's presence, categorically we are talking in two terms, or from two points, or two positions. When we talk about God's presence, at least I want you to remember two things. One is God's presence is like we are gathered together in the church in a place or a vehicle that is dedicated or a session that is dedicated to for his name. That's when he said, you are two or three are gathered in my name. In my name. That's the presence of God. He said he will be there. Hallelujah. So the presence of God, we're also talking about gatherings as we are in this service today. And we want to believe that the presence of God is here. Hallelujah. So that's one category. The second category is when we talk about the presence of God, we are talking about somebody who is probably in a private place, who is on his own or her own, but is communing with God, is talking with God. That person is in the presence of God. Hallelujah. The presence of God, we are talking about when you shut off all distractions, when you shut off all those concerns and all those, you know, cares of life and you focus on God, you want to talk to God. You want to communicate with Him. Personally or privately. It may be in your bedroom. It may even be in the bathroom or in the toilet. Hallelujah. Awkward places. But you know you are connected to God. That you are in the presence of God. Hallelujah. The presence of God, if still in that category or that uh, 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 definition, could be when you set up, it will be in the box and you decide to pray to God. You decide that you want to shut off all the distractions and all the, all the things going on around and you are relating and talking to God. In fact, you are also receiving from Him as He talks back to you. Hallelujah. May that be your experience in the mighty name of Jesus. Many times in the Old Testament, when God wants to get the attention, we we'll read the scriptures in a minute, 
when God wants to get the attention of those prophets or those who are related to he has to use something uh, physical. He has to use something significant to catch the attention, to get the attention. For Moses, he started up a fire in the bush, and the bush, the fire was burning, but the bush was not burnt. All the leaves were not burnt. And then Moses had a look at that and said, this is strange, this is spectacular, this is different. There's something about this, this is not usual. And then he drew close to look, and God called out from there and said, come closer, Moses. In fact, take off your shoes for where you are standing. You are in my presence now. Hallelujah. Amen. Then he spoke to Moses, told Moses a lot of things. He told Moses what to do, how he's going to go about the next set of assignment he had for him. May you have a regular experience with his presence in the mighty name of God. His presence of God. Give us a You know, for, the, for those of us who read the Bible study, but we, let's read that. We'll move on now and come back to it. Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. I'm encouraging you not to read the Bible studies 6 p.m. On, on, on Thursdays. Join through the Zoom link. We are uh, trusting God that every time you come, you will not go out the same. You will be blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Numbers chapter 17. We were reading that job, Numbers chapter 17. And I'll come back to that verse because we're going to draw at least five lessons from there. Five lessons from there today. Numbers chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. Just verse 7 and 8 of Numbers chapter 17. Let's read that together. And we'll read a couple of other passages. And Moses placed the rods. Here, for those of us who knew the Bible study, there was a contention. There was a debate and there was a rivalry that was started out by the children of Israel against Aaron. Aaron supposed leader that God called with Moses. And they were, you know, scandalizing him and, you know, saying a lot black men, trying to blackmail him and say all sorts of nonsense and challenge him. They were launching a challenge to his leadership. And then God asked Moses to take all the rocks of all the leaderships and then bring it to his presence. And Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the some translation said in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. The translation in the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. Moses placed the rods there. Verse eight. Verse eight. Verse eight. Now it came to pass on the next day. That's what we are looking about at Bible study. That Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron and of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds, had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Hallelujah. Amen. We'll come back to this verse in a minute because there are four lessons I want us to take from this. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord. Give us, before we come back to this, give us Psalms chapter 91 verse 1. Psalms chapter 91 verse 1. Quick succession, we we'll look at that and we'll look at another Psalms before we move on. Psalm 91, verse 1. The, presence, the beauty of the presence of the Lord. When I, well, one of the, I, I, I've shared before that I've made mistakes in my life, but there are also times I've done things right. One of the times I thought things very well is that when I, at any days in my Christian life, I realized that the presence of God matters a lot. In the presence of the Lord, there is a lot on offer. Safety and abiding in the presence of God. That's what this title gives. Okay, that, that's good. I think you will know. This one gives you safety and abiding. Safety of abiding in the presence. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In the presence of God, there is guaranteed safety. Hallelujah. Amen. I won't even talk about that one. The secret place. The secret place. There is a secret place. You know why the, word, the Bible calls it secret place? There are two reasons why the Bible calls it a secret place. Number one, it is not easily found. Hallelujah. You know, people can come to church. All kinds of, and some people can design and figure out the presence of God even in this church. But some can come and just think it's a normal service and then they come in and walk away. My prayer is that you will be the one that will discern that there is a secret place of the most high. Amen. You find that secret place. So meaning that it's not hidden, it's not common. It's not just something somebody stumbled into that way. There is a connection that you have to have to that. And Holy Spirit is there to make the connection. Hallelujah. 
That's number one. The second reason why God calls it a secret place is that he's kept away from the enemy. Hello. He's kept away from the enemy. No matter how intelligent, no matter how sophisticated the enemy, no matter how nos nosy the enemy becomes, he will find those who are in the secret place of the most high. Because it's secret to him. Hallelujah. Right, so see, if you are there, the plans you are making, the things you are strategizing to do, the enemy will not have a wind of what you are doing. He tries because you are in the secret place of the most high and he, he is taken on away. He is beaten by time. By the time you come out, he says, where is that coming from? You will dwell in the secret place of the most high. That's why I believe this is too strong. This is why God calls it the secret place of the most high. Now, give us Psalm chapter 91. Sorry, chapter 92. Just the next chapter, Psalm chapter 92. We do 12, 12 to 15. Verse 12 to 15. And then we'll go back to the first one we read and take our we read and take our four lessons. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Okay. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. May you be planted in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Those who are planted in the presence of God. Those who are planted in the presence of God, he said they shall flourish. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. They will flourish. You will flourish. Amen. If you are looking for flourishing, if you are looking for a way where you will do better than you, be in the presence of the Lord. Long and crave for the presence of the Lord. Give us the next verse, verse 14. They shall still bear fruit in old age. Hallelujah. Age will not be a factor for them. It shall still be a fruit in old age. Meaning that there are things that people cannot do when they get older, but they will be doing it by the strength of the Lord. You know, I tell you, the day I began to pray for this presence of the Lord, I'll tell you a little story. We went for the ordained minister's conference some, day, some years ago. The general overseer of the church had not, I think he was about 75 or 76 at that time. And all the pastors who were over 3,000 in the room. And that was just what God opened my over maybe 5,000 of that big uh, auditorium in England at the time. And the man, a 75 year old man, stood up that night after preaching, after a long preaching. He stood in front of us and said that he's going to lay hands on every one of us. He uh. shook me. I was, when I was sitting there, I mean, how are you going to do this? Lay hands on everyone. Fuck. Look at the whole couple. I mean, Wow, he stood there, and all of us lined up from column to column to column to when he was standing there. I said, This man is a man of the presence of the Lord. There is no way anybody can do and do that at this age with that strength. This is not physical strength. And when I read I say they shall be fruitful in gold. The strength is everything. Even me, as young as I am, I can't stand that long. You know, everybody like one by one. And I said, No, 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 there's more to this. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm convinced the young is there with that. And it's true. It was a long night. We came for fire out, all of us. She was a little single person. The hand did not grow weak. His leg did not, he was standing there. After a long preaching. Uh. They shall be fresh and flourishing. May you be fresh and flourishing. Amen. They'll take us back to. Take us back to, okay, verse 15. Let's read verse 15. To declare that the Lord is upright, your life will be a testimony that the Lord is upright. When you are serving, when you are a believer, one thing that God does not want to come out of your life is that some people ridicule him because of you. No, 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 no. It means something is wrong. He wants your life to declare that he is upright, that he is a righteous God, that in him there is no righteousness. That's what you want your life to echo. That's what you want my life to echo. And so shall our life be in the mighty name of Jesus. But we must abide in his presence. We must abide in his presence. We don't want to visit his presence. Tell him, but don't visit his presence. Don't visit his presence. Abide. Abide. Hallelujah. Some of us are just strolling in and out. From 
today, by the grace of God, will abide in His presence. Amen. You become a regular thing. When you are leaving home, you leave, you will carry the presence of the Lord. For families, your family, your your family as a whole would be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. In the presence of the Lord. Get, take us back to that. Let's draw our five, five lessons before we close. Get, get, take us back to Numbers chapter seventeen. Numbers chapter seventeen. There's eight, in fact. Just stay on this eight. The presence of the Lord. Write down if you have note, in the presence of the Lord, there is fertile ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is fertile ground. There is fertile ground. Now, God told at Moses, bring these rods, these rods, these rods, which I have a rod here to demonstrate. A rod, a stick. Okay, where is our drum stick? This one is not a good as rod. It's a small one. Hallelujah. <laughs> this is not a rod. This is drum stick. But imagine this maybe five times bigger than this. Okay? In size of uh, the thickness and length. Yeah, five of them. This stick, or uh, let's, for example, say this rod. What are the things you can tell me about this? It's dry, isn't it? It has no water content. Nothing. Okay? But when you take this, no matter how dry a fellow is, when you take that person to the presence of God, the presence of God provides a fertile ground. Amen. When they brought the rod before the tabernacle, you know the natural agricultural science. In fact, you don't need to be have a bachelor's degree in agricultural science to know that for anything to grow, you need to plant it into a ground, isn't it? You need to provide soil for it. Soil of soil. And it's not just every soil, because if you bring clay soil or the soil from the beach, sorry, the thing is not going to grow. So when you bring soil, you bring some kind of manure or fertilizer to put to that soil, to make things to grow. Is that not true? If it's the wrong time. In the presence of God, there is spiritual manure, there is some additive, there are some elements to promote growth that are in the presence of the Lord. There is a ground, there is a soil that is in the presence of God. So they brought these sticks, they brought these rods before the presence of the Lord. And because God wants to distinguish Aaron, that is part of what we are looking at on, on Thursday. But he provided a fertile ground, a fertile ground for this rod to grow. May you experience that fertile ground in the mighty name of Jesus. If you're listening to me over the internet, you've been trying to make something out of life. Why don't you try Jesus? Why don't you come to his presence? Because his presence is promising a fertile ground. His presence is promising some fertility. His presence is promising some soil that is conditioned to make you grow. Hallelujah. Amen. He has the nutrients you need. Literally, to, 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 for the sake of time, I would have told you a little bit of story. But literally, I found this is one of those things I also found early in life. I said, in fact, as a result, I looked at my life and I looked at the progresses I was making. And I noticed that all of, almost all of them, all of them, were tied directly, directly to the presence of God. Hallelujah! Amen. The first car I had in my life, it was through the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah! Amen. Even the second car was through the presence of the Lord. That one was so directly to me. I said, "Wow." God, they are telling me something. That your presence, I'm going to do better. I said, I'm not going to need your presence again. When it comes to you, Lord, anything that has to do with you, I'm giving preference. Because I can see loads and loads of flourishing. I can see loads and loads of doing well. <laughs> because of your presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Number two. So, number one is the presence of the Lord provides fertile ground. And, of course, nutrients. You see, there is nutrient, there is nuggets of life that are coming to your life as a reason of his presence. So, if we're talking about the manure, the fertilizers, there is nutrient. Where, let me ask you a question. When they brought these rods before the presence of the Lord, did you read any place that was a, a ground, a soil, or any nutrient or manure that were put there? No, the presence of the Lord provided all this. May that be your experience in the mighty name. Amen. 
Number two, the presence of the Lord serves as a root to draw virtue. It provides roots to draw virtue. Now, when we are, for any tree, any plant to grow and bring forth buds, being feared, buds and bring out to sprout for any any tree, any plant to do that, it must first have what roots. Roots represent connections. Root is the connection between the tree and the ground. So roots represent connections. The presence of God provides some connection between humanity and divinity. Hello. Hi. The presence of God is where you can connect to heaven. Literally, that's what God demonstrated to Jacob. Jacob came to a point where he was, when he was running away from his brother, Esau. He came to a point, and then he was lying down to sleep. He saw that there was a ladder, there was a ladder that connected earth to heaven. The ladder's foot were, the, 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 the bottom of the ladder was on earth, the top of the ladder was into the heavens. It had no end. Just Jacob learned that connection. Jacob said, ah, I need this level of connection. And angels were going up and coming down. Going up and then bringing things down. Jacob said, no, 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 no. This the presence of God. He said, I will not treat this place unusual. I mean, I, mean, I will not treat this place, place common. I'm going to do something about it. May you experience the presence of the Lord. Amen. Where you experience this connection. Amen. Brother, I'm speaking to you. The connection you need is not the connection of your uncle. Or that of that man. That's a brother I'm talking to here, by the grace of God. It's not that connection you need. You need this. You need his presence. Hello? Hi. Where well, nobody may see any physical roots. But indeed you have roots. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Nobody can cite any physical connection between you and the but indeed there is a connection in the spirit realm. You have that connection in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Number three, because of our time, number three, the presence of the Lord provides the light and the sun you need to grow. Everybody here. This, this is one of some of these miracles that de de defy science. Hello. Good science students. Do we have good science students here? Hello. Oh, am I talking to Charlie? Anyway, even if you at least you learn biology, little biology, photosynthesis. Uh, you know, if, oh, I mean, in basic school, you're going to do that experiment. I did that experiment. They tell me to plant two, two seeds. Or two flowers, you plant two flowers, you take one flower, expose it to sun, and then the other one you hide it in a locker where there is no light, where there is no sunlight. And they tell you after four days, go and bring two of them out. <laughs> or five days, go and check two of them out. What do you find? The one that is hidden in a room somewhere is withering. In fact, the leaves are turning yellow. Of what kind? And the ones that were exposed to sunlight is doing well. Hallelujah. Amen. You bring them out and they tell you, you make the judgment. Now, this thing, these rods were hidden in the tabernacle. Mm. But what do we read here? They did what? They sprouted, they put forth buds, and they produced blossoms. And you then ride almond. Wow. Where was the let, let me ask you where was the sun coming from? Where was photosynthesis? What happened to photosynthesis? What happened to all this now? In the presence of the law, natural laws are set aside. And divine injunctions kick in. The blessings of the presence of God. May you enjoy it in the mighty name of Jesus. And finally, number five or 
four. Number four. Let's stop at number four. Today, the blessings of the Lord. Remember what we are saying. Even if, for those of us who were on Thursday Bible study, this is, we are sharing notes here too. Even if you have to grow a tree or any fruit, whatever, at least you should take what? Weeks or some days. Anybody? Please, this is teaching. This is not preaching. And what's the fastest fruit that grows on okay, anybody? I wish so poor in uh, farming and agriculture. Talk to me. Maize? Three, four days. In three, four days? Sprouts. In three, four days. Okay, I'm talking about fruits. Purple. Does it grow so fast? Genetically modified. <laughs> if you genetically modify it, right? how how big okay, let's put it this way. Is there any food that grows in one day? <laughs> one day. You plant it today, tomorrow you have the fruit. Not possible. Not possible. Hallelujah. And it came to pass the next day. The next day. The next day. That's accelerated growth. In the presence of God, there's accelerated growth. It is people think they are losing time. People think there is a waste of time in the presence of God. People think they are delayed. People think that, you know, oh, this God thing, this prayer thing, this going with God thing is, is only delaying me. I should have been faster with life. I should have moved forward more. I should have made more progress. No. It is when you are in the presence of God that you are speed, you are progress, you everything get enhanced. The next day, the next day, they came. They discovered that the same day, within 24 hours, within that, there was sprouting, there was putting forth buds, and there was producing of almond blossoms, and there was fruits, and not just fruits, the fruits was ripe. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah. Everything fast track. May God begin to teach you that in, your, in his presence, your life is on the fast track. Yeah. There are many people who want to play fast in life, in life, who want to be on the fast lane. Can I subscribe to you? Can I recommend to you the fast lane is the presence of the Lord? Hallelujah. That's where we take a short time. Within 24 hours, you will see a lot of rapid progress. Because of his presence. Hallelujah. In his presence, I mean, all of us here, I want God to give you a testimony that his presence is going to activate a fast track miracle in your life. Amen. Rise up in your feet. The blessings of the presence of God. Talk to the Lord and say, Father, I want to experience the beauty of your presence. The beauty of your presence. Are you feeling delayed? Are you feeling retarded one way or the other? That's you. Something is slowing down your progress. This morning, I want you to pray, Lord, I want to activate your presence in a new dimension. This dry very dry sticks or rods were brought before your presence and we notice an accelerated progress here. We notice some blossoming. Lord, let that mark my life. Let that mark my situation. In Jesus most wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. Father, we thank you. The beauty of your presence we desire, Lord. Amen. I pray, Lord, that everyone that is here or listening to my voice, that as we hear this message and as we desire and convert your presence, that we must receive evidences 
and testimonies of new soil, new ground we are making in our lives. We also pray there will be testimonies of blossoming. Testimonies, Lord Jehovah, of you setting aside natural laws and activating your own divine order in our lives and circumstances. Father, our life shall be a testimony. Our life shall show that we are people that abide in your presence. Amen. Help us to do our part that we will abide in your presence. Amen. Help us to come off and overcome distractions and side attractions and all those things that the enemy throw at us to make us to be consumed and ignore your presence. No more today, Lord. Amen. From today moving forward, we will abide in your presence. Amen. Even as a corporate people, as a corporate group, coming to your presence, Father, may that become our priority. Amen. In our closets, in our individual homes, may we long and crave for your presence. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jehovah. Thank you. Father, grant us your divine speed. Amen. And we will have testimonies of your faithfulness. Amen. In Jesus' most wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's put our hand together for the Lord as we prepare to give our offerings. Hallelujah. I will invite uh, Brother Femi after the to come and pray for the offering.
to come and join us to celebrate in his presence. You are welcome to us of praise. We are God's family. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 